one of the many wonderful things about being a doctor is that it's just full of oral history and lore and folk stories of one kind or another. You've heard already in the last couple of days that modern medicine, as I view it, actually started around 1848 with the advent of general anesthesia, because before that time it was hard for physicians, for physicians to really do anything useful to patients, but once they could put them to sleep, Keith, all hell broke loose. Uh, you could do anything, and so the first thing doctors started doing once they could anesthetize patients was to do amputations, and they could do that because they could do that without infection, because they didn't understand many of the issues around infection. Lister came around in 1867 or so and said, look, you know, we're infecting these people. They're using cat gut without sterilizing cat gut, so they were taking the intestines of cats and using that as sutures without sterilizing it. It was a bad plan. And so when he figured out that if you just used carbolic acid to wash his hands in the suture that you could actually open up people and start doing things. And so the first thing of use that people did was Bill Roth, Austrian-born surgeon, began doing organ removal and he was started, his first operation was a total gastrectomy for someone with cancer of the stomach. This was in 1881. And for the next 30 or 40 or 50 years, uh, I like to view this as the era of extirpation medicine. Essentially when things went wrong, people cut it out. So think of any ectomy that you want, whether it's an appendectomy or a nephrectomy or a gastrectomy, a esophagectomy, it's all common, it means they cut it out, and they cut it out because it's not working. The interesting thing sort of happened around 1935 or 36 is that people said, you know, instead of just taking things out, why don't we put things back in? You can bill for it. And so doctors, so the first useful implant was a total hip replacement in the United Kingdom. Uh, the next sort of interesting implant, as I see it, actually it happened out of the Royal Air Force in London after the Battle of Britain when people had plexiglass in their eyes and they couldn't figure out why it was so well tolerated. And one smart doctor said, you know, why don't we make lenses out of plexiglass? It seems to be tolerated and we'll make intraocular lenses. And so lots of implants started happening in the 30s and 40s, but the first really interesting implant that I want to talk to you about today is, is an implantable pacemaker. So this is now therapy being implanted in the body that's actually quite sophisticated. This is the first implantable pacemaker, 1958. This thing handing off the end is, is it not a lead, it's an antenna. So you could have, this thing had a radio in it. So that's sort of a Kiwi shoe can that they packed in mercury batteries, transistors, a radio, some capacitors, and then they implanted this thing inside people's bodies. And this was the first it was life-saving therapy, really. So it's a, not only was it, these are no longer extirpation medicine, these were devices that were put in to save lives, uh, sophisticated, really. This is 50 years ago. So pacemakers evolved over time. This is a current generation pacemaker that you can see is actually quite different from this thing, if you can kind of look in on this with the cameras. This is a current sold pacemaker that has probably four or five times the magnitude of sophistication of this device. It's programmable, it has accelerometers in it, uh, it has memory, it can be interrogated, you can communicate with it. You can see it has leads on the back side of it and so this thing is implanted under the skin and these leads are then snaked down through the venous system into the heart. So those of you who don't know pacing can look at this uh, first video. And this is minor surgical precision. It, it, it usually requires about a day in the hospital. The surgeon will make a decision under the clavicle, the collarbone. They'll drag these leads down and they're permanently implanted. Uh, they can be extracted with a little bit of energy, but it's not easy. And this is pacing. Millions and millions of people have this. And I think it's fair to say that it's life-saving for most of the people who get pacemakers. And it's pretty straightforward technology. What I thought I would do today is sort of show you where this technology is going in the next decade and let you use your imaginations about where it could go. So I showed you the first thing. This is sort of a evolution of pacing over the last 50 years and on the far right of your screen is the pacemaker that I just showed you. None of these pacemakers have the leads and just parenthetically the leads are a big issue. Uh, some of you may hear this is these are wires of course that go down into the heart that sense the heart and pace the heart. Most of you probably know that the heart beats nearly 100,000 times a day. It's a vigorously beating organ. There's massive torsion and motion in these things. It's a miracle that these leads don't all fracture. 
Most of them don't. Some of them do, and, and it's, that's a big issue. So you'd like not to even have these leads, but what I'm showing you here, again, is just a progression in size of the pacing can, the actual generator, not the leads. Again, these little tails hanging off these devices on the left are actually antenna, so that you can speak to these implants and turn them on, turn them off, reprogram them. The antenna has gotten miniaturized. You don't see it on the rest of these, and you're not seeing leads. Now, I want you to look carefully at the far right side of this slide. And this is our next generation pacemaker. Uh, it's leadless, and I'm holding it here in my hand. If you can see this, this is about the size of an antibiotic capsule. It's got a seven-year battery. It's got a radio. It's got memory. It can be interrogated. It can be reprogrammed. And it's leadless. And I can't emphasize how important this leadless story is. Uh, not only because there are issues with leads, but again, sort of to follow on the theme of what Dean was just talking about, there's lots of places in the world where there is not the sophistication of physicians to actually implant the pacemakers that I was showing you. And so this next video I'm going to show you, again, this is sort of the relative sizes of these devices, okay? And again, I want to emphasize that the device on the left, it's in development, will be available in three or four years. Uh, has no leads. So how would you do that? And again, if you follow this, I can teach you all to do this here in the audience. Um, it's pretty simple. Instead of making an incision, we actually come up to the venous system with a catheter. And this little thing is just shot out like a piece of shrapnel. It's got little wings on it that capture and actively fix this. They are actually the pacing element as well. And so this thing just stays inside your heart. It's again, one of the great miracles of life that you can leave shrapnel behind in the body. It seems to not mind it. It's a titanium case. So. That has a lot of implications because we can use this in places like India to implant pacemakers. Right now in the United States, for our population, we have somewhere in the range of 3,000 cardiac electrophysiologists who are trained in implanting pacemakers. In India, a population over a billion, there are approximately 90 physicians trained to implant pacemakers. We will never be able to train enough physicians to put pacemakers in the way that we have put them in. This is a simple procedure that actually a medical student could do. It's a pretty good idea for India. It's a pretty good idea for the United States. And so hopefully this is one of these things that will slingshot back. Now, here's where you can use your imagination. What you see here are all the areas of the body that we actively pace today. This may come as a surprise to some of you. For most of you, probably not a surprise. Everything in your body is electrically active. There's, no matter what you're doing, I can trace this back to an electrical chemical reaction. Whether it's the blink of your eye, the release of digestive enzymes, the contraction of your heart muscle, the movement of your fingers, the movement of food through your gut, uh, exchange of sodium ions in your kidney, neurotransmitter release in the brain, you name it. Give me an example and I will trace that back for you to a simple, profoundly simple electrical chemical reaction. Everything. So if you accept that for a minute, it should not be a cognitive leap for anyone in this room to recognize that if I took two pacing electrodes and plugged them into your body anywhere and turned them on, Richard, something would happen. Now, not always good. But our aim is to actually do therapeutic modulation of this electrical chemical reaction. And what you see on this slide are all businesses that we have today where we do good by pacing something that needs to be paced. Now, the ones that are asterisked are still under FDA investigation. And you can look at these. I mean, you can see that these guys are pacing depression. How do they do that? Well, some of you may be aware that we've paced for years people with profound movement disorders. So people with drug-resistant Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, profound spasticity, dystonia. Uh, it turns out that you can actually pace them out of many of the symptoms. We're not, these are not curative treatments by any means. We're simply confusing the message. We have a world-famous neurosurgeon here who will hopefully not hold me too close to this because I'm just a simple cardiologist, but Keith, we have these primitive structures at the base of our brain. They're called the basal ganglia. I don't know if Dr. Newland is still here, but I went to medical school at Yale where he is. And one of the many distinctions about Yale Medical School is there are no examinations. And so I thought that sounded good. And so when they started talking to us, Keith, about the basal ganglia, I said, I'll be skipping that. 
because there's not a chance in the world I ever need to know about basal ganglia. So Phyllis August and I just went out and had coffee. And I skipped it and it came back to haunt me because it turns out that I think about the basal ganglia every day. These are deep structures in the base of your brain that are very primitive that actually are the Cisco systems of your mind. They route everything, movement, thought, intention, you name it, they all get routed through the basal ganglia and either get reflected back to the cerebrum or down the spinal cord. So again, it shouldn't be a surprise if we took pacing electrodes in there and turned them on that something would happen. And because neurosurgeons had kind of got into trouble 50 years ago with knives kind of operating the brain and actually it disrupted the basal ganglia, they realized that they accidentally cured Parkinson's disease with a kind of unwieldy knife. And so people realized, gee, if we could probably get down there and pace in these areas and, and override signals that we don't want. And so we're basically confusing the message in the base of the brain. And this is a profoundly effective treatment for Parkinson's disease and dystonia. Now, the amazing miracle, too, again, by accident and serendipity, is people realized with, un, with knives that went in the wrong place that they could actually cure people out of things like obsessive compulsive disorders and drug addiction. And so we actually know that, too, that we can actually pace the deep brain and pace people out of obsessive compulsive disorders that are, that are really life-limiting for them. We have a humanitarian device exemption for that. So if you accept for a minute that we can effectively do that, and I assure you that we can, it shouldn't surprise you that if we can pace obsessive compulsive disorders towards more normal behavior that we could pace drug addiction. Uh, and we're pretty confident that we can pace people out of drug-resistant depression. So that's just an idea, and I, I bring that up to steal a concept from you, which is, which is use your imagination. So you can, all these things are on fire with electricity. It's just a matter of getting there and pacing them. So let me just come back and, as an aside, say one other thing in your imagination is remember we've implanted this little device that is a pacemaker, but this thing has a radio and it actually can talk to your BlackBerry. No, really. So imagine that. So imagine that we could remotely program these things from Minneapolis when you've just got this thing in Bangalore. That's our intention. More interestingly is that this microelectronics I'm showing, and I'm going to show you something that's actually degrees beyond this, uh, can actually be used as a sensor. And we're going to put these out into the pulmonary circulation of patients with heart failure. And our intention is to remotely monitor millions of patients with heart failure and keep them out of the hospital by monitoring their pulmonary pressures. You heard about that? earlier uh, from this young woman who had high pulmonary pressures. It's actually very easy to measure these pressures. It's the same technology you monitor your tires in your car with. But we're going to implant it deeply with microelectronics and be able to remotely, using these kinds of technologies, follow people with heart failure. Now, this is sort of the final stage of, of deep miniaturization of microelectronics. We take a little battery, we take an ASIC board, hybrid, we put it on, we put an interconnect in so we can get things out of this thing. These are all welded, titanium case sealed, and this is the technology that we're using to make this. It's not complicated. Dean, if he's still here, would look at this and say, that's not so hard, I can do that. He can definitely do this. And this is all sealed up, and these are these little microelectronics. Again, this will be about relative scale to a penny. This will be for our pressure sensors, for our pacers. This happens to be an injectable monitor that is injected under the skin and can monitor the, the heart rhythm and basically transmit this to a BlackBerry or Android phone. This is where we're going. And our intention is to take a six inch wafer and we are currently in a wafer fab that we work on in Tempe, Arizona, plan to make 100 pacemakers on the six inch wafer. You might say, how would you do that? This will just give you a very sort of cartoonish view of this. We're gonna take a six inch wafer. All the electronics can be implanted on this wafer. This is sort of chip technology, just as we had for diagnostics, now for therapeutics. So we'll put all the accelerometers, the processors, radio, We'll flip this, we'll hermetically seal those. This is on a chip and turn it over. And here's the hard part is, is batteries at last. This is thin film battery technology. It could be other types of energy scavenging that we're going to do here. I'm not going to go into the details of how we're going to harvest energy. But in the end, this will be the next generation pacemaker. And you'll see the size of it relative to a penny. Now, use your imagination. If you can make a therapeutic implant of this size, 
that has batteries that will last for years, what would you do with it? Where would you use it? How would you implant it? Because I mean, these things can be shot like bullets. It becomes a pretty interesting story. It's not far-fetched. This is engineering. We're not trying to solve cancer here. It's simple engineering. And because, again, everything on the body that I've talked about is electrically active, it's just a matter of going there. Thank you very much. Thank you.